Welcome to Why Public Service, a podcast of the R Street Institute, a free market think tank in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Kevin Kosar. In each episode, I speak with an individual who made the choice to participate in governing our nation. Some of my guests have worked for the government. Others have toiled in various private sector organizations, including think tanks, philanthropies, and political groups. All of them share the same goal, however, which is to improve our country through public service. Today's guest is Mike Petrilli, the president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, a think tank that studies education policy and promotes educational excellence for every child in America. The Fordham Institute has offices in Washington, D.C. and the great state of Ohio. In addition to leading a think tank, Mr. Petrilli for many years has been a research fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, the executive editor of Education Next Journal, and a distinguished senior fellow at the Education Commission of the States. He also has held positions in the United States Department of Education and at K-12, a private e-learning company. Mike Petrilli is the author of The Diverse Schools Dilemma, the editor of Education for Upward Mobility, and the co-editor of How to Educate an American. You can learn more about Mike Petrilli by visiting FordhamInstitute.org. Mike, welcome to the Why Public Service podcast. Hey, it's great to be with you, Kevin. You've held many different positions in public service. For today's episode, I want to speak to you about your leadership of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. And my first question for you is, how did you end up the head of an education policy think tank? What was the path? Yeah, well, Kevin, you know, in my case, I was lucky to uh, really be there on the ground floor when the Thomas B. Fordham Institute was just getting started. I started at Fordham as the third employee back, this was back in 1997. Uh, We were just getting off the ground. And I have spent much of my career at Fordham. I I spent about three years doing kind of junior level things and then left and spent five years mostly in the George W. Bush administration and then came back as basically the the deputy, the number two with an expectation that uh, as our founder and my mentor, Chucker Finn, was preparing to partially retire, semi-retire, that uh, if all went well, I I would take over. I'd say backing up a little bit before that, you know, I, I have been interested in education policy really since college. So I'm one of the few people using their college degrees at the University of Michigan. I was a political science major, but I did my senior thesis on education reform, got my teaching certificate kind of on the side. And this was in the early uh, to mid 90s when things were really starting to happen, charter schools and school vouchers and accountability. And, you know, there was a lot happening in education reform. Uh, that seemed promising and exciting to, to a young person. And so I jumped in and uh, this was just as, uh, quote, education reform was getting started. When you got out of college, were you uh, aware of think tanks? Were you thinking the think tank path was going to be the one for you? Or was it a career you found after doing other things? Yeah, you know, I, I was interested in education policy and in being an education reformer. Uh, but I didn't know what that meant. And there really wasn't much uh, going on back then in those worlds. I, I remember, as I mentioned, I, I did the senior thesis on uh, ed reform in Chicago. Uh, I ended up getting my teaching certificate. And for about a year and a half, I, I worked, uh, I got a chance to, to teach in a non-traditional setting, which was at a camp, basically, a six, you know, place where kids went for sixth grade camp. And that was some, some fun way to get some teaching experience. But then I knew I wanted to move to D.C. and do education policy. Well, I didn't know what I was doing. I found a list on Education Week of all kinds of uh, education associations, and I started writing them all. And, uh, you know, it was the alphabet soup of groups and, uh, and didn't get much response. I actually did get a response uh, finally from uh, a man, Craig Gerald, who's now a good friend of mine, uh, who was at Education Week at the time, who hired me as a summer intern working on the second ever Quality Counts report uh, for Education Week. And that gave me a chance to get to D.C. and finally learn a little bit more about how these different groups operated. And, uh, and by happenstance, bumped into Checker Finn, then uh, starting the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. Uh, you know, think tanks was not something I was necessarily looking at. But now, uh, you know, I, I understand more what think tanks do uh, and their role in the education policy and just the public policy world. Uh, it is something that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I knew I wanted to write. I knew that I wanted to be uh, focused on the world of ideas. Uh, and now I understand that think tanks are the right place for that versus, say, an association or an advocacy group. Though I get to work with those uh, organizations all the time as well. 
What are your responsibilities as the president of the Fordham Institute? Do you get to spend much time thinking? I, I do. It's pretty great. Well, first, Kevin, I should tell you a little bit about Fordham because we are a think tank, but we do other things as well. Uh, we have a staff of about 25 people and a budget of about $5 million. And we do work uh, nationally as a think tank, but also on the ground in Ohio. Uh, Thomas B. Fordham was an industrialist way back in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, his money uh, savings turned into our endowment. Uh, and when we got started in the 90s, uh, after his a uh, much younger wife uh, passed away at an old age. We decided that uh, there wasn't much donor intent and, and the decision was to focus on education reform both nationally and in Ohio. So we've got an office in Columbus, we've got an office in Dayton, and then an office in DC. And, and in Ohio, we do serve more as a policy advocacy organization pushing for education reform, defending charter schools and school choice and accountability. And we also out of Dayton are a charter school authorizer. That means we are the entity responsible for overseeing the results for about a dozen charter schools. So we are this strange hybrid organization that gets to work at the national, state, and local levels and, and do think tank work, but also have, have uh, at least a foot in the real world of schools. So, uh, so as president of the Fordham Institute, I need to worry about all of that. You know, I, I oversee the, the team. I'm uh, very lucky to have a senior staff that is fantastic, uh, five folks that report directly to me, and then they have different parts of the organization that report to them. So, uh, you know, part of what I do is the basic leadership and management that any CEO would do. Uh, I certainly spend a fair amount of my time raising money, uh, but I do get to spend also time uh, doing the think tank work of writing, blogging, tweeting, uh, speaking, uh, doing radio shows and all, and all of that. And again, in our world, it's focused on K through 12 education reform, following the big debates that are happening in that world, and also trying to promote what we see as smart policies going forward. You've given us a little flavor of the sort of things that you get to do, but can you mm -hmm. give the listener an idea of what the average day looks like, if in fact there is an average day? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a real mix. But I would say, um, you know, I, I try to carve out some time every day to do some writing or, you know, that kind of intellectual work because I enjoy it. And, uh, you know, that is what we're supposed to be doing, right? We are so lucky to get to play that role. So, uh, you know, I try to do that usually in the mornings, maybe a couple hours where I'm, I'm writing a blog post or a journal article or I have various times over my career working on a book. You know, then there's, of course, some meetings. Those are often, uh, you know, with potential funders or with funders. Uh, you know, fundraising, as I mentioned, is a big part of my role, though, you know, not as much for some of my colleagues. But, you know, our, our business model is basically to go around with a tin cup uh, to 10 or 20 national foundations that care about education and education reform and try to find projects that we are, want to do and that they are interested in because of their approach and strategy and mission. And then what else? You know, we, we end up engaging a lot with partners. We're, we're a small organization, 25 people. You know, the think tank part's even smaller. And so if we're going to have any impact, it's, it's going to be by having deep relationships with other organizations that uh, can take ideas from a think tank like ours and, and put them into practice. So, for example, we, we helped to start an organization called the PI Network. It's a terrible name, but it stands for Policy Innovation and in Education Network. And it's an umbrella group of about 100 ed reform organizations around the country, uh, many of them based at the state level. Uh, and they really are, are groups that wake up every day and try to push a legislative agenda in the states related to charter schools or accountability or teacher stuff. So, you know, I spend a fair amount of my time with those organizations and trying to be supportive and help them do what they do and, uh, you know, help them formulate policy ideas. Those are the kinds of organizations that, again, can translate our writing and thinking and kind of big picture talk into actual legislation, into actual policy change. We also, as an education group, you know, do a lot of that kind of work with folks that are more uh, practitioner oriented, you know, the superintendents and principals, especially in the charter school sector, but others as well, trying to have an influence on, on the way they think and in their work also. So you've been working in education policy for a long time now, and it's complicated by the fact that there's a local state role and also a federal role. What lessons have you uh, learned about governance of education policy. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, boy, what lessons. It, it is hard. It's a mess. You know, look, we have an education system that we all inherited. It's been around for over 100 years. 
at, at the beginning, that gave America a great advantage. We were one of the first countries, the first country to have mass education, universal education. Uh, that was hugely important to our success in the 20th century. But the downside means that we have this system that's pretty old and rickety and uh, maybe made sense at the time, 100 years ago, makes less sense. Today, we've got these 14,000 school districts uh, that uh, you know, really make the key decisions in education, of course, the 50 states. Uh, and then the federal government that uh, you know, has, has waxed and waned in terms of its interest in education and its attempt to try to get these schools to bend to its will. Uh, what all that means is it's a mess. Uh, there's a million veto points. Uh, you know, if, if you are trying to run a traditional public school, you've got to worry about all these different levels of governance, all these different people basically telling you what to do. And what that means is there's, you know, every year more and more layers of red tape and regulation and, and restrictions when what you maybe really need is, is just, you know, a clear path to doing what's right for kids. That's one reason why I've become a big fan. I have always been a big fan of charter schools because the notion was to break through all of that and to try to start fresh and to try to carve out some room for educators to just do what they do best without all of the complexity. Now, it's not that simple. And over the, time, over the years, charter schools have, have had to increasingly deal with more and more layers of governance as well. This is just the nature of running institutions that are in the public sphere. But I do think you can now look at the track record of charter schools and say that the governance innovation that they represent has been hugely important and allowed them to get better results and, and have more innovation and, and get things done. It's not, not that the people in the charter school sector or are more talented than the people in the traditional public school sector. It's just that the governance all works better. So long story short, governance matters tremendously. So you're the president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. What's the toughest part of your job? You know, I, I think I would say it's, it's keeping the faith that what we are doing on a daily basis is having an impact in the real world and long term. You know, any given day, you can look back and say, oh, my goodness, is it anything I'm doing actually making a difference? It doesn't matter. You know, unlike so many other jobs out there, I can't look and, and point directly and say, hey, you know, let's say I'm, a, I'm building a road and I can look and see that we made progress on that stretch of road today. Instead, it's all very long-term. We're trying to shape the way people think about problems and put issues on the agenda and get public policy moving in a certain direction. Uh, and it's slow and it takes time. And it's only after you maybe a year, five years, 10 years, you look back and say, okay, I can see that what we have done has contributed to a, an important shift in thinking and in policy and it's made things better for kids. We can do that in, in some respects, you know in the charter school movement, as I mentioned, and we've been a part of that uh, since the beginning, in the push for higher standards. Uh, now there's a big push uh, to try to ramp up the quality of curriculum, and we're starting to see that pay off. But it, you know, day by day, it can be a challenge to see that your efforts are adding up to anything. And, and of course, that, that matters to our own uh, motivation and enthusiasm, and it also matters to funders. We have to make the case constantly to our funders that what we are doing is making a difference. And that can be challenging in the short term. Over the long term, it's easier, but, uh, but it can be hard. And particularly when some of these funders, understandably, they want to be able to report to their boards on a fairly short-term basis that the funding they are doing is making a difference. And that can be a challenge. With your degree in political science, you could have done any number of things, but you chose public service. Why public service? Yeah, look, I think that I have always been interested in this notion of trying to uh, you know, improve public policy, make the world a better place, you know, kumbaya. Uh, and, and I think I certainly now understand that there are lots of ways of doing that. I think that private enterprise and, and many businesses that have been able to have, have changed the world uh, for the better, much more so than a lot of the things that we, uh, we want to do in education policy or public policy writ large. But I do think, uh, you know, it, when, when we think about how to create a better America, I continue throughout my whole career believe that public policy matters. And in my world, education matters, you know, that all the big debates uh, we're certainly struggling with right now, income inequality, you know, racial injustice, even some of the concerns around climate change, you know, so much of it comes back to whether we can provide more opportunity to young people, especially young people growing up in poverty, young people growing up in working class neighborhoods, 
uh, it's impossible to get from here to there without better schools, you know, and, and this is, schools are one of these things where we have so much more control over them as public uh, than we do so many of the aspects of kids' lives. You know, it's really hard to have much traction on families and what goes on in the home or, you know, how to fix, uh, you know, run down neighborhoods. I don't know how to do that. Uh, but I do know that it is possible uh, to improve schools and to turn schools from bad schools to good schools. And, and if we could do more of that, dramatically more of that, uh, we would have a much better country. So that keeps me motivated, you know, and at the same time, I have figured out that I enjoy speaking. I enjoy writing. Uh, it's something I'm good at. And so if that's a way that I can make a contribution, I, I just feel so fortunate that that's the case. Mike, thank you for keeping the faith. Thank you for your efforts. And thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Kevin. It's been a, a real pleasure. Thank you for listening to Why Public Service, a podcast of the R Street Institute. Please subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. Even better, rate and review us on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. Tell us what you thought about it and who we should interview next by finding us on Twitter at RSI. If you want to know more about R Street, sign up for our newsletters at www.rstreet.org. I'm your host, Kevin Kosar. Thank you to producer William Gray and editor Parker Tant from parkerpodcasting.com.